Episode 27 There was a crash, like the falling parts of a dream fashioned out of warped glass, mirrors, and crystal prisms. Montag drifted about as if still another incomprehensible storm had turned him to see Stoneman and Black wielding axes, shattering window panes to provide cross ventilation. The brush of a death's head moth against a cold black screen. Montag, this is Faber. Do you hear me? What is happening? This is happening to me, said Montag. What a dreadful surprise, said Beatty. For everyone nowadays knows, absolutely is certain that nothing will ever happen to me. Others die. I go on. There are no consequences and no responsibilities, except that there are. But let's not talk about them, eh? By the time the consequences catch up with you, it's too late. Isn't it, Montag? Montag, can you get away? Run, asked Faber. Montag walked, but did not feel his feet touch the cement and then the night grasses. Beatty flicked his igniter nearby and the small orange flame drew his fascinated gaze. What is it about fire that's so lovely? No matter what age we are, what draws us to it? Beatty blew out the flame and lit it again. It's perpetual motion. The thing man wanted to invent but never did. Or almost perpetual motion. If you let it go on, it'd burn our lifetimes out. What is fire? It's a mystery. Scientists give us gobbledygook about friction and molecules, but they don't really know. Its real beauty is that it destroys responsibility and consequences. A problem gets too burdensome, then into the furnace with it. Now, Montag... You're a burden, and fire will lift you off my shoulders. Clean, quick, sure, nothing to rot later. Antibiotic, aesthetic, practical. Montag stood looking in now at this queer house, made strange by the hour of the night, by the murmuring neighbor voices, by littered glass, And there, on the floor, their covers torn off and spilled out like swan feathers, the incredible books that looked so silly and really not worth bothering with. For these were nothing but black type and yellow paper and raveled binding. Mildred, of course. She must have watched him hide the books in the garden and brought them back in. Mildred... Mildred, I want you to do this job all by your lonesome, Montag. Not with kerosene and a match, but piecework with a flamethrower. Your house, your cleanup. Montag, can't you run? Get away? No, cried Montag helplessly. The hound! Because of the hound! Faber heard, and Beatty thinking it was meant for him, heard. Yes, the hound's somewhere about the neighborhood, so don't try anything. Ready? Ready. Montag snapped the safety catch on the flamethrower. Fire! A great nuzzling gout of flame leapt out to lap at the books and knock them against the wall. He stepped into the bedroom and fired twice at the twin beds. 
They went up in great shimmering whisper with more heat and passion and light than he would have supposed them to contain. He burnt the bedroom walls and the cosmetic chest because he wanted to change everything. The chairs, the tables, and in the dining room, the silverware and plastic dishes. Everything that showed that he had lived here in this empty house with a strange woman who would forget him tomorrow, who had gone and quite forgotten him already, listening to her seashell radio pour in on her and in on her as she rode across town alone. And as before, it was good to burn. He felt himself gush out in the fire, snatch, rend, rip in half with flame, and put away the senseless problem. If there was no solution, well, then now there was no problem either. Fire was best for everything. The books, Montag. The books leapt and danced like roasted birds, their wings ablaze with red and yellow feathers. And then he came to the parlor where the great idiot monsters lay asleep with their white thoughts and their snowy dreams. And he shot a bolt at each of the three blank walls and the vacuum hissed out at him. The emptiness made an even emptier whistle. A senseless scream. He tried to think about the vacuum upon which the nothingness had performed, but he could not. He held his breath so the vacuum could not get into his lungs. He cut off its terrible emptiness, drew back, and gave the entire room a gift of one huge, bright yellow flower of burning. The fireproof plastic sheath on everything was cut wide, and the house began to shudder with flame. When you're quite finished, said Beatty behind him, you're under arrest. The house fell in red coals and black ash. It bedded itself down in sleepy pink-gray cinders, and a smoke plume blew over it rising and waving slowly back and forth in the sky. It was 3.30 in the morning. The crowd drew back into their houses. The great tents of the circus had slumped into charcoal and rubble, and the show was well over. Montag stood with the flamethrower in his limp hands, great islands of perspiration drenching his armpits, his face smeared with soot. The other firemen waited behind him in the darkness, their faces illuminated faintly by the smoldering foundation. Montag started to speak twice and then finally managed to put his thought together. Was it my wife turned in the alarm? Beatty nodded. But her friends turned in an alarm earlier. That I let ride. One way or another, you'd have got it. It was pretty silly, quoting poetry around free and easy like that. It was the act of a silly damn snob. Give a man a few lines of verse and he thinks he's the lord of all creation. You think you can walk on water with your books. <laughs> well, the world can get by just fine without them. Look where they got you, in slime up to your lip. If I stir the slime with my little finger, you'll drown. Montag could not move. A great earthquake had come with fire and leveled the house, and Mildred was under there somewhere, and his entire life under there, and he could not move. The earthquake was still shaking and falling and shivering inside him, and he stood there, his knees half bent under the great load of tiredness and bewilderment and outrage, letting Beatty hit him without raising a hand.